You're listening to the Every Day is a New Day show. Inspirational conversations with movers and shakers about moving forward and choosing to embrace a positive outlook. Now, here's your host, Kim O'Neill. Welcome, welcome. My name's Kim O'Neill, and I'm a twice certified transformational coach, Reiki master, best selling author, podcast host, former crime analyst, and big believer in learning from everything so you can confidently move forward in life. You can join us for the live shows most Wednesdays on Facebook at 6 p.m. Pacific Time. And now, here's today's newest awesome guest. I'm really excited to introduce to you today's guest because um, there's just a lot of things that I love about her. But one of the things that she um, you know, focuses on is emotions. And that has become something that I've become really interested in unexpectedly over the last several years. So with that said, I'm excited to introduce to you today Isabel Hunt. Welcome, Isabel. Thank you so much for having me. After months of figuring out a time to get together, we finally made it happen. Yay. I know. <laughs> I know. You know. Thank you. Thank you for being open to scheduling it, you know, in advance and sticking with it because because um, I really do love what I've learned about you so far, and I'm excited to share that with our audience today because. You know, as, as you know, lots of things going on in the world, and um, I'm excited to hear about your personal story, but then also just this expertise that you've developed in emotions and processing and healing and that kind of stuff. So, yes. yeah. So, so the way I like to start this is I'm going to go ahead and share with our audience your bio, which is, of course, touches on what you do in a nutshell, and then we'll get into the heart of, of things. So, so if you're just meeting Isabel for the very first time, allow me to introduce her to you. Isabel Hunt is a successful inspirational speaker. She's the founder of the hashtag I see you movement. So she's a sociologist, a certified transformation coach working with highly sensitive visionaries and world changers, also known as empath warriors. I love that. She's an mm -hmm. emotions clearing practitioner. She's a published author of The Power of Faith Driven Success and also an Amazon bestselling co-author. Her expertise revolves around navigating your emotional world, the power of intuition, and the importance of trust and perseverance in today's society. And she's been featured on close to 100 TV, well-known radio and podcast shows, in addition to the Everyday is a New Day show. So <laughs> that is Isabel in a nutshell. And Isabel, you know, I think I, think I actually just want to jump right into the emotions thing since we've already started to touch on that. What, you know, what led you to wanting to learn about emotions and really, really focus your work in that direction? Um, good point. Before we start, if anyone hears any rumbling, because it sounds like we're really getting a storm in, um, it's a lot of wind and <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> so I hope I will stay on nothing that's going to happen because we do need the rain in the Midwest. At least we do. Um, in Indianapolis because we haven't had any, so we have to let it rain. Um, but what got me interested in emotions, it's actually interesting because it's, um, I have been working on a very important speech for myself over the last months, which was supposed to go towards the TEDx, which fell through it that yesterday, which was a little disappointing, but oh. I made it through the very, very last round, but then they changed their mind and um, added someone else, that's all right. but. Um, what really got me interested in emotion was my own experience and how I experienced the world. Okay. Um, growing up, I always saw everything in a different light. I was always able to look beyond the physical, beyond what is visible, physically visible, the tangible, because I didn't know that was anything special about me or different, but I saw my whole life, I've seen everything in color. Um, it's like my, my mirror neurons don't just sympathize or empathize with other people. It's literally turning everything in color. Um, it's, it could be letters. It could be um, numbers. It could be places. Um, and the, the colors change according to one's emotional state. Even a city has an energy around it or a number within the context has a specific energy around it. And so it keeps changing. For me, numbers usually don't change as much, but especially people. And for me, I've always seen people in color, <laughs> not their skin color, but someone may show up in blue and pink and, and 
purple and i was like why do they look like that i don't know for me it was just always the same like it was never anything special and so over the last 10 years i'm originally from germany i grew up in east germany and so there was no i, I grew up very strict lutheran so any kind of weird woo woo thinking ye, they would have probably burned me a lot <laughs> maybe not exactly that but you know it, it would have been a little bit witchy yeah um, and I knew at the age of 12, I had this prophetic dream that where I, I watched myself on a big stage as an adult. I knew it was me, but I couldn't understand what I was saying because it was in different language. And I knew that for me to figure out who I am, I had to leave the country. I had to step away from everything I knew, the way I grew up. I needed to have a different perspective on life. I couldn't stay within the picture that I grew up in. And when I moved to the US for the first time, I was 18. I just had to check it out of like, okay, why am I supposed to go there? I don't want to move there. It's just, no, it's not for me. I didn't even like English, speaking English. And so I came and when I came here, I, I was in, the first time I came up, I lived in DC. I worked for family as an au pair. I just felt really like I've been here before. I jokingly said to my parents, are you sure you didn't adopt me? I'm like, ah, funny. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I, I look like you. It's obvious I'm not, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was just like, I was meant to be here. I've been here before, just all felt so natural. I picked up English very quickly, almost without any accent. If I do have one right now, it's because it's getting late. <laughs> when I'm starting to get a little drowsy, that's when, when the German comes through a little. Um, but I just knew that this is where I was supposed to be. And then I had to go back to Germany because visas didn't work out and I didn't really know how to do things really. I went back and I got my degree in sociology, psychology, which I was always interested in. My dad is a, was a social worker and he used to work with youth and now he does similar work I do. So I've always had that interest. I read psychology books at the age of 13. I contacted universities. Can you just give me a little bit of your books like just to check it out and they did so okay wow um it was pretty cool yeah but um i during that time i had a lot of ups and downs very emotional ups and downs because there was a lot of change and then it didn't align with my dream and i was very set on how this was supposed to go just very attached to it so i had a lot of um, anxiety and depressive faces I, I don't know if i want to call it depression it what it felt like that in the moment but it was it just a face for me while i was figuring out what's going on because when your whole nervous system is overstimulated that is what happens your body breaks down and says well we need a break we're not doing anything we're shutting down um that's what depression is about we're shutting down <laughs> you go inward if you don't do it it just gets worse and usually we don't know that so it just gets worse right, right. or it just sustains but um at some point i was able to come back i'll make it short because it's actually a long story uh i came back um i used to live in new york then san francisco and then i came to indianapolis where i'm still at after almost over 10 years <laughs> got stuck in the midwest oh that was my my goal or my dream but it happened <laughs> I think I needed it because Midwest is very conservative and very um, sheltered almost. It's like their own little walls around them. And when you bring in a different perspective, you pretty much talk against the wall. It's like, how dare you? <laughs> um, so I had to have this experience. But what really was the, the turning point for me is I got married. Um, Again, lots of ups and downs. I almost got deported, had to go to Canada, blah, blah, blah. Um, if anyone wants to hear my whole story about that, there are lots of other interviews with the exact details, but it's not quite relevant for your question. Um, after I got married, I, I did a job and I didn't, it was just really overwhelming. I, I like to interact with the people, but always on the phone, like I wasn't, I did an administrative assistant job and it's just like too much too much. I knew I was meant to do something different and more, something with my degree. And uh, my husband said, well, you need to just stop your job. Then we, we're fine financially. You don't need that and figure it out. And he was always been one of my biggest supporters in everything I do pretty much. Um, 
unless it's stupid, then he tells me. <laughs> but, um, but then a friend through a friend of a friend invited me to come to a coaching training, which was a cult, an, an ontological coaching training. Okay. And so it was more spiritually aligned. And while I was going through this, I hated them. I hated my mentors. I hate my coaches. No, I love them. But it was really rough. It was rough because I had to re-identify with who I am. I had to figure out what defines me besides my culture, besides my country, besides my education. And that was really hard. And I, that's why I said I would have not been able to do this work in Germany. I needed the challenge to be taken outside of what I knew wow. to recreate myself. Yeah. And um, during that time, I also heard that term empath. And so I started to learn more about like, wait, the seeing the color is actually something supernatural. Now, when I talk, especially when I do TEDx speeches, when I create those, I, I call it synesthesia, which is more of the medical term. Okay. Where your mirror neurons just, it's like um, people who hear music or um, people smell music. <laughs> it's kind of odd. Like your senses are just switched. And so for me, it's just all color, right? And um, I was like, oh, that's weird. But how am I supposed to use that? Like, what am I supposed to do with that? And during that time and the deeper I went, the more uh, intuitive I became, the more I realized the gift that I had and how I was perceived by other people and how I was able to literally see through people, which freaked people out as well, because it's like, don't look at me. It's creepy. You see through me. I'm like, I don't. Like, no, 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 you know things about me that I wouldn't quite share with just anyone. Um, so for me, there are not really any secrets with people. I'm not going to get into someone's head or I'm not going to totally tune in because that's ethically not okay. Um, I only do that if there's permission. But when I see colors, it's like just a different kind of item, clothing item. Like I see your color, like that's what you show up as. For you, by the way, it's magenta, magenta, magenta. How do you say it? Magenta, magenta. Okay. I don't know the exact um, meaning for that. I would have to look it up because I try not to memorize it because then I become prejudiced. Oh yeah, you should see this, or you you should have this color around you. Um, I'll let you know. Um, Thank after. you for sharing that. By the way, I mm -hmm. I absolutely love this, and I just want to say that I I I can identify. I don't know if we've had the same experiences, yeah. but I'm like, oh, she's sharing something with me that I want to learn deep, even more about myself. So mm, I can, yeah. yeah. So thank you for, yeah. yeah. I love that. So going through this whole journey of identifying as an empath and what that means for me and how that fits in with all the spiritual, like I got very deeply spiritual involved, not religion, but really spiritually involved. Um, in the way I experienced the world and how suddenly everything became one, like literally when I meditate, everything just dissolves into one energy field. It's just an incredible experience to have. But through that, I was like, okay, why do colors change around people, even if it's the same person? Like that doesn't make sense to me. And so I studied the psychology of color, okay. and the meaning behind color. I um, studied everything. I mean, psychology was already something that I studied in college that I had my degree in. Um, more so sociology, but it all just mixes up at some point, right? So I really got into the psychology of color. I wanted to know what, what Goethe already knew back then in the 17th century and what he already knew about color, the color wheel and how they're connected and how color makes us feel. And that's when I really studied it. I'm like, color makes us feel. So if I see the color around things it's their emotional state it's almost like their soul trying to communicate with me something that they may not be able consciously to, to notice yet wow. or maybe it is a confirmation it's not like telling you the future or this is what is going to happen to you it's really in the moment where your soul is like emotionally this is where you're at i'm communicating our soul is communicating with us through our emotions our emotions are um are the, the warriors, the, the gateway to our soul, right? It, it's like, um, uh, not missing the word. <laughs> I'm missing the word. Uh, the, <laughs> no, it, it's like, it just, I'm very visual, so I'm telling you pictures. So if you just want to envision it, your, your emotions are pretty much the guardian of your soul. Okay. 
Like, it's like they're standing in front of the door to your soul and they're telling you what your soul is trying to communicate with you. Are you out of alignment? Are you not out of alignment? Are you actually really going in the right direction? Do you have to deal with certain issues right now? Is there something that needs to be healed? It's a very clear message. Most of us okay. just look at the physical, the biological when it comes to emotions. So what I learned is that my gift of seeing color is related to emotions, to how we experience life. And I can see it in a collective. I can take a look at a country and see a specific color and how it's moving. I can see it on a global level and then I can see it on an individual level. And that is why it makes me an, a visionary. I'm not very good with super detailed things. Like in business, that is my biggest struggle, that detailed stuff. Okay. I want to share my visions. I think that's why speaking is so much me <laughs> because I just can speak my visions. If people get it or not, doesn't matter in that moment. Usually two years later, people are like, oh yeah, we heard you two years ago. You already mentioned like, yeah, you get it now. Finally, good. <laughs> you know, those kind of things. Um, but it, it, it has happened. So um, I wouldn't be totally... It, it just doesn't concern me that much anymore if people get it. I just know that it usually is something that is in service of a greater good that brings us closer to embodying love and community and connectedness. Okay. So from there, I realized that my big advantage is not just my gift and my highly sense of intuition and seeing patterns moving around, but also bringing that into um, cultural issues. Oh, wow. Like how are we able through this knowledge, through emotional awareness to shatter cultural barriers, to um, engage in cultural transformation, not just um, locally, but globally. And with that awareness, it's not just being aware of what you feel in the moment. It's also emotional awareness from my perspective is also about um, what stigmas do I go after? What labels? I mean, I've come here to this country with a certain understanding of who Americans are. And I remember I, I, had a, I was at a, an event in Orlando and I was talking about that. When I first came to the US, I didn't feel safe. I, because I didn't know who I was. I didn't okay. know how I would fit into suddenly this much bigger world because let's be honest, in the US, everything is a little bigger, <laughs> bigger, faster, louder. <laughs> everything is just, oh, no wonder that people are totally overstimulated and their senses are just always on, always. I'm not used to that. Okay. Now maybe after 10 years, I'm starting to get used to it. I know how to handle it, but um I would always say things like when we have conversations with friends and they say, oh, yeah, in America, we do them like, oh, are you Americans, you like in Germany, we do it this way. And obviously it seems to work better. So why are you not doing it the way we do it? Or in Europe, we do it this way. So I kind of downplayed their experience of life. I kind of diminished their experience of life, not doing it consciously. Or actually, I was aware of it because the way I spoke but I didn't do it on purpose. Like it was literally, I had this in mind, this list, and that what I went through with every conversation, this is better, this is not, this is worse, this is better. You know, I had always this, this comparison and that is about awareness, emotional awareness as well, and how we compartmentalize, how we label, how we stigma. And that's where my background in sociology comes in pretty well. <laughs> well, and it sounds like what you said earlier, you had this fear because you didn't know who you were. So mm -hmm. the more that you became aware of who you were, did that fear naturally dissipate or change or? Not necessarily because um, knowing who you are does not necessarily equal knowing your stories that you go after. <laughs> like you have people who say, well, that's just me. That's authentically me. If I, if I cuss the whole time, that's just me. If I say certain things um, that might be hurtful to someone, well, if you don't want to hear it, then just don't listen to it or just keep scrolling. Um, so I think nowadays, especially with the coaching world so expanding, we have to be very careful not to just say, oh, I have figured out who I am and we can still act asshole-ish. <laughs> That's not a word, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we get it. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the German English version of it. Um, we can't, we, we, we still 
anything that is not based on love and compassion is not part of who you are because the deepest core of who you are is solely based on love. So, okay. So I love that you, you came to that conclusion. How did you learn that for yourself? Um, through a lot of hardship <laughs> and a lot of people um, calling me out on, on stuff that I sat in a certain way or um, where I hurt people or where um, people suddenly got mad at me for no reason. At least that's what I thought there was no reason. But really, it, it, it even if I was just thinking something like we know everything is energy, right? So even what I think has impact on people right in front of us. So because I'm so sensitive and I'm so strongly in tune with things like people can probably hear my thoughts pretty loud. My mom always said, your face speaks, <laughs> your eyes speak too. <laughs> like, I was like, don't look at me this way. I know exactly what you're saying. I'm like, I'm not thinking, how do you always know? I'm like, your eyes are so clear. It's like you, it, it's just visible. <laughs> you can't just do that. <laughs> do, you, do you recall what that was like when you realized, oh, I am love? Or you start to feel a lot of more, a lot more compassion for people who you would usually hate on. Um, it is very well known that I'm not a big fan of the current administration. Um, it's not a secret uh, for various reasons. But here's the thing. Um, you can not agree with someone, yet you can show compassion for that person. When I look, and that again, that is my experience. So whatever people want to take from that or judge or whatever they want to do. Um, when I take a look at Trump as an example, I see a hurt young boy. And all I can think of is I totally hate what you do. I totally despise you for some of the things you say, but I am sorry. I'm sorry for the pain that you have had to go through to act a certain way. I'm sorry that you had to make experiences that have you believe now that only power is something that has you be seen or feel seen. I am sorry that you have never experienced um, the love that maybe a child should have experienced that has you react a certain way to certain people. I am sorry for the way, for anything that has happened to you that you feel the need to to prove yourself in a certain way if people agree with it or not if you take a very close look um, most people who who do not act in a greater interest of all always respond from a, a place of pain and that's where i can say i can I see you, I can feel compassion for you. That doesn't mean I have to agree with you. That doesn't mean that I can't hold you accountable to certain things that are obvious, like environment. People who know me know that I'm very strongly passionate about environment, um, but also health. I can say that, but I can yeah. still see you. Yeah. So tell me more about your personal journey about how you were able to see all these colors and then it led you to psychology and then learning that, oh my goodness, these colors are actually, they're a thing, they're a spiritual metaphysical thing and linked to emotions. When you started learning more and more about all this, was there some, like what's just coming up naturally for me and so tell me if this is not how it played out for you but is that i'm thinking that there must have been some sort of healing that would have taken place within you once you realized oh my gosh these experiences have all been linked and kind of what's coming yeah. up for you I think, yeah. yeah um well once i realized i think through through the coaching training i had experienced a lot of healing already because Oh, that was rough. <laughs> that was a whole year of roughness. I literally, um, the, you have a love-hate relationship to the people who teach you. It's not just teaching you how to coach. It's literally going through everything that literally your clients go through. And if depending yeah. on who you are and what you do, well, it could even be more rough. Like I didn't even want to go. It's like if I wouldn't have to pay all that money, I wouldn't even show up. <laughs> but it was a valuable lesson. I, I think that really almost broke me to the point where 
I had to, I had to break internally to be able to be open to a new perspective of life and on life. Um, that makes a lot of sense because I think, I think for a good portion of our life, we, you know, we have this, mm-hmm. I don't even say assumption, but we have this assumption that we know who we are until we have some sort of experience that's like cracking us open mm-hmm. and that we may have this level of resistance towards where it's like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to these, you know, I don't want to go to this class anymore, but I'm not committed I and I spent the money. And, um, and yet that's a good thing because it helped you reach that breakthrough point is what it sounds like. And now get to know yourself in a different way. Yeah. That's why pretty much if you do want to see a shift in your life, it's at one point in your life, at least once, you have to spend a certain amount that would hurt you if you wouldn't <laughs> do it. Um, I'm telling you, at least once you have to do it. You don't have to do it the whole time. You don't have to do it for your whole life. You don't have to spend $50,000 on any coaching. But once in your life, you probably will have to because resistance will show up. When you do the deep healing work, resistance will show up 100% because you you justify yourself because every time you felt like, well, the culture that I grew up in is um, is morally and rationally right. I am right. That like, we're always compare everything to the way we grew up, that box that we grew up in. And I mean, growing up in Germany, something especially culturally that is very significant for my healing process was being um, called a Nazi. That is part of our history. And no matter how far you go and move forward, I have nothing to do with it. Uh, My mother and my my father had nothing to do with it. My grandparents had nothing to do with it. My great-grandparents actually lived it. They were part of the war. My mom and my great-grandmother lost her husband in the war. And she kept telling us all those stories. We're all quite quite close in age. So I actually did live with my great-grandmother for quite a while. But that picture of Germans are Nazis it stays with people. Like even now, the first thing I heard when I came to the U.S. and people found out I was from Germany, so are you a German spy then? Oh, that was geez. the first thing someone said to me. And that was the first time where I had to really think about how is my own history defining my beliefs today? Patriotism was not a thing. You will not see German flags in people's front yards. It's just not something we do because in in our heads, we believe patriotism led us to um, that war, to becoming the Nazis. So we can't do that because otherwise we might repeat. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of movements now alive. And I think it is just like here in the U.S. as well, where it just has to come to the surface. So we realize what is still lingering inside of us. But I realized how much I also used that box as an excuse to not to do certain things, to not reach out to other people, to not reach out across cultures because, well, they they define me like this anyway. So they're going to judge me anyway. So why would I even bother? I wasn't ready to let go of that story. And so a lot of healing had to take place for me to understand why I have this gift and how I'm supposed to use it for a greater good. It took me um, the majority of the last 15 years, pretty much every single day, writing down, uh, what did I realize today? What was my belief today? A good story um, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, I had dropped off my son at camp. I thought, well, I feel like going to Target. Who doesn't like to go to Target? I know. You can't stay there too long. <laughs> you can't stay there. But I, I I, had a goal. This is what I was looking for. I left. Um, I drove out, and there was this young guy, mid-20s. I'm like, man, he's too young to stand out here and beg for money. But to sign set, I see you. You see me. Please help. Wow. And I felt so bad. I was like, oh my gosh, now I feel guilty. This poor kid. So I gave him $5. And I drove off. And while I was driving off, I'm like, what in the world did you just do? From your privileged thinking, you already had the assumption that he needed money. Did you even ask him what he needs for help? What kind of help does he need? He didn't say give me money. 
He said, I see you, you see me, please help me. All I want to do was being seen. I started crying in the car. I went home. I was like, I need to go back. I made him some lunch. I went back and I looked at him and I said, thank you for helping me see. And he looks at me totally and like, you were the one who gave me five bucks. Do you want to have your money back? I'm like, no, I don't want my money back. But I had to realize something that I just assumed that you needed money. And not once did I think about asking you what you need. He felt so, he, you could see how his head went down. And I'm like, what makes you come, what made you come back? I'm like, because my work is around all of that you said. I see you, you see me. And I realized that the, the stigma, the practice, the label that I put on him as being homeless, of course you need money, right? Whatever you do with it. It's uncomfortable to even have a conversation with you. Right. But I went back and I said, what do you need help with? I'm really asking you, not just money-wise, but what do you need help with? How can I help you? And so he told me a story that he was adopted from Ukraine. There we go, shattering culture barriers, right? Mm -hmm. And I told him, hey, I'm from Germany originally, so I can relate to being in the country. And he was he was a teenager when he was adopted. He was in an orphanage. His parents were um, drug addicts. And he told me his whole story and what he's gone through and that he just doesn't even, he's never been taught how to handle money. He's never been taught how to reach out for resources, what resources he even needs. He just didn't even know any of that. So wow. I said, here's the thing. If you promise me to send me an email to this email, I will reach out to people that can help you. So he did. And he was serious. He sent me a message back and he's like, hey, this is my email. Please help me. And only because he had the sign, I see you, you see me, and I have this hashtag, I see you movement. I'm like, I can't just let this sit and let this go. But those are all, like, those awarenesses, that is what we have to deal with to break those culture barriers. And like I said, seeing colors just helped me to come to that conclusion that there is more to a person than just the obvious, the hair color, the skin color, the education, where you grew up, your parents. There's just more to it. Your soul is actually speaking. And I realized when I gave him the money, I connected with him from the head, from the logical side of it. Of course you need money. You're homeless, right? But looking at him from, from the color perspective, it real, I realized I connected to him from soul to soul. I realized he was actually part of me and I was part of him. And for some reason he had to teach me something and I was able to help him. He um, is now in a, in a housing where they help him figure things out. He's only in his early 20s. And um, he just felt really lost because his adoptive parents thought they would help him adopting him from an orphanage at the, at the age of 11 or 12, but didn't understand that putting him suddenly in a new culture that he wasn't familiar with actually can create more trauma no matter if the situation itself is better. Wow. And this is something, again, that we have to become aware of. We are right now in the process of adopting. It's something I have to be aware of. Just because we're adopting a child doesn't mean that they have to feel better now because we help them. We save them. Even if they're an infant, even if they're newborn, there is a story, an energetic story attached to the person that we take them away from. Growing up inside of it or growing inside of another woman, there is history that energetically attaches to it and that we have to be aware of when we interact culturally. At the same time, while I was holding on to my history and to my story, even though I was not even involved in it, um, I, I also realized that I had a story against people from Russia, Poland, because I grew up in a communist, under communist government, wow. East Germany, right? So I was mad at them for even coming over and putting that on us and taking the chance away from us to live like West Germany because they had it all great because Americans saved them. We didn't get saved. We had the crap going on. My dad couldn't get his degree until he was, until the wall came down. So I realized the anger that I had towards those cultures because of some of them still have communist government um and i held on to that because of you i'm here where the person hurt me was my age i had nothing to do with that right so i had to let go i'm like i can't be the victim i 
I cannot blame you for what happens to me now or what has happened to me in the past or what has happened to generations before me. And that's how we can shatter emotionally cultural barriers if we can be honest with ourselves. Am I just using my story to justify, to um, revenge, to, to look for revenge? You have treated my people like this for so long. Now I want revenge. Right. What do we really want to accomplish, you know? So what I love about this is is it's really it's really undoing those labels that we automatically unconsciously slap on to pretty much everything. And and set, it's taking those away and getting to the core of, you know, well, what is this really about? You know, who is this person? Who am I? And and allowing yourself to, again, not operate from here, but operate from the heart and really connect on that soul yeah. heart, heart level. Something that just came to mind, I think often we try to figure out who we are when in reality or when, when actually deep at the core, all there is for us to acknowledge is that we are love, that we are light. And so it's actually more about figuring out how can I get closer to being love, to being light, and what is in the way of getting there? I think we get so hung up with who am I? What am I supposed to do? Well, actually, all you're supposed to do is through whatever you are physically and tangibly going to do, it will reveal some stories to you. It will reveal the areas that need to be healed to you. And all of that is part of just becoming more who we are knowing already that we are love and light. So I think so many people are just so hung up with, what am I supposed to do? Who am I? Well, there's for you to know is that you are love because God within, the divine within, we're all part. Like when we would take, if we were to take the physical way of us, all there's left is the soul. And when there is no boundaries, if there's no limitation, the souls just come together and create something bigger. It's like, it's like when you pour water into water, it's just become more water. It just becomes one. And that's the same with souls. So we become one if the physical wouldn't be here. All of that is separating us from that is our beliefs, our labels, our stigmas that has always made us believe that we are separated, separated from the divine, separated from each other. So, yeah, I agree. And I think it's it, we so easily can overcomplicate things and it's learning how to <laughs> not be as busy. So at least we feel like we're doing something. <laughs> ah, well, so let's go back to what your work as an emotions clearing practitioner and seeing colors and things like that. When you are able to see a color uh, on someone um, mm -hmm. and I know you said it evolves and stuff like that. What what happens next? What how does that lead into more information and how you're able to assist your clients? Um, usually what comes out, well, for one, people can, clients just can rarely actually lie to me <laughs> or try to manipulate me or try to, that's another thing. The more awareness you have, the more, uh, the less you're able to be manipulated. People just can't manipulate you just like that because you're so aware of what's triggering and what's happening. So um, what helps me is just literally saying, hey, this is the message that your soul seems to be communicating or trying to communicate with you right now. And then we can go deeper into what's behind that story. What is the lesson within what I just showed to you? What is that next step for you? Um, what area does it relate to that needs healing? Um, so we can get really, really deep. It's uh, very powerful a lot of times people are very resistant to it like i don't want you to see me that deep i'm always very there's no judgment because i've gone through it and i still like every single day you just if i wouldn't still go through it i would disappear because then i really would be energy of love <laughs> Not right <the> right. <laughs> right i wouldn't be here so there's no judgment it's just part of of what you're called to do here so that we can heal the collective not just the individual focus on that. So there's nothing bad or good about it. It's just what it is, right? It's what we need to take a look at right now so that we can come closer to an understanding of unity and community. And so that helps me really just to see, okay, like I also often when I do like intuitive color readings in my group, um, I create like specific prayers for them for that lesson that seems to be involved in that color right now. Um, 
I love. I also have been working with kids lately. Um, it's so fun when they when the parents call and I'm like. They want another session. Do you have some time? <laughs> like, mommy, we're gonna have another session with Isabel. I want to talk to Isabel. Um, it's I don't know. I, I have this gift that people trust me very quickly, and especially children. Um, they don't question what I tell them, they just want me to explain it to them so that they can understand it and then it, it resonates with them. Um, my five-year-old helps me with that. Do bring it down into simple language. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it has helped me really just to see the changes too, because every time I have another conversation, another call with them, I might see a different color or something else like that needs to happen before they can move on or something so, that needs to be released. So how, so for an adult, would they come to you if they're currently dealing with something that's, um, maybe some form of emotional trauma and they want to heal and release it or would they come to you like what's the situation that they usually it's different through? it's actually very different some people really just come to me because hey I'm, I'm really like i can't seem to get rid of those depression and anxiety experience okay. like i know there's some trauma because i had been abused as a child or uh, certain things happened to me that i know need healing i have those clients too or those those people that are pretty much just coming for me to do the emotional work, which ends up always going much deeper. Like, hey, uh, this is coming up. This is what we're just released. This is an exercise for you to continue doing. This is something that you need to pay attention to. Like even when I release trapped emotions, I no longer do single sessions because of what else may come up. It's, it's just like when you remove something, uh, something stronger may just come up to the surface and then you can't, I cannot, I responsibly cannot just let them hang there it's just not something i can that makes sense yeah. <laughs> it's just like sorry well yeah. you sign up for one session so i can't help you so that's why i don't do it anymore but um a lot of times it's also that especially people who work with me like really intensely who are more identifying as highly sensitive or empath warriors they just know that a lot of healing needs to happen so that they can be that warrior so that they are able to balance the the intro with the extra and understanding how they're supposed to use their empathic gifts um in a way that it furthers the mission of um shattering cultural barriers Okay. Wow. Well, it, tell us, so then how does that translate into what you do with kids? Because I'm thinking kids probably don't know, you know, oh, I'm an empath. I need to. No. <laughs> um, that. A lot of times, uh, it, like what I have been, the kids that I've been working with so far, all of them had some kind of trauma. Oh, um, okay. Either one of them, her birth mother was a math addict. So she had a lot of issues um, psychologically with bipolar depression. Okay. Um, we didn't work too much more with each other. I don't know what happened there, but um, and another child, she's on the spectrum. So she always gets really overwhelmed, especially when she, school starts because she feels like this, she just feels so immensely, or most of them just feel very so strongly with the children that they are with that they take it on and that causes them to withdraw not to make eye contact to get anger tantrums just similar or typical um symptoms you see with people on this or with children on, okay. me, on the spectrum and so i help them release some of those emotions that cause those symptoms and then usually they're more calm, they are more present. I share prayers with them. Oftentimes I just talk to the parents as well, like, hey, this is what's coming up. Maybe we create this prayer. Can you pray that with them every night? Like that they don't have to take on other people's stuff to save them because um, children who are autistic, for example, are very intuitive, it's very strongly intuitive. It's an incredible gift that is covered under the label of you're sick there's something wrong with you um and when you're that sensitive and you you you're just so focused on that you can't focus outward it's just very hard to I get out of your own world because of that overstimulation so just helping them to say hey you're okay you actually just have a really beautiful gift and you're showing people how to feel instead of how to react Children like that, especially who, who are not high functional, they teach you a different way of communicating. 
like how high see color mm -hmm. you have to start listening you have to start feeling them you have to start watching observing most of us don't and then it's not oh it's not normal they literally just teach us to go back to basics like i want you to see me even if i cannot react to you i want you to see my soul even if you can't talk to me with words it's I, like breaking the barrier of language yes i i totally relate to that i used to work with a girl who had congenital muscular dystrophy and it affected the part of her brain that controlled her speech so she couldn't really speak and i had to completely learn how to slow down and learn how to speak her language which was all pretty much through our um Mm -hmm. just into abilities and connecting on that level. And so I totally get it. Um, what would you say, how does, how does uh, learning how to, you know, understand your emotions and understand who you are, anybody, um, you know, on a, on a deeper level beyond the, the labels, how mm -hmm. would you say a deeper understanding of those things helps someone to move forward in life? <laughs> well, you don't give a fuck anymore about what other people say. <laughs> okay. It's like, you don't really care. It's like, well, I'm, the thing is, the more aware you are, the more confident you are. There's nothing people can bring to your awareness that you may not already know. Like, okay, last night or yesterday, when I got the email, like, hey, uh, we did not choose you to speak at our TEDx event. I was so certain that I would be on it because it was the perfect topic. I had an amazing conversation with them. I had it all, like it. even this whole talk came to me again. Like most of the time when something is supposed to work out, they just come, it's just downloads, right? And I wanted to share a story that I have never shared ever before again because it's very personal and it's very embarrassing too but um it was about race and my label around race and uh i was really disappointed i was really angry i was i was like why why i really thought i had it um and i could have gotten myself into the whole thing okay uh, there's no sense in continuing this work like doesn't make any sense i did say that actually but i also realized after like 10 minutes like okay what am i feeling why am i so disappointed because i was disappointed because i was attached to what happened so i envisioned detaching myself and still having my great speech um but that awareness has helped me to do this interview with you today because I could have easily said I'm not in the mood because I fucking hate what I do. Like, I don't want to do any of this anymore because nobody wants to hear what I have to say anyway. So why? You know, I could have easily done that. But because I had this awareness, I sit down, I cried for a while. I listened to some music. I locked myself in my office, told my husband, leave me alone. <laughs> I need to grieve that. <laughs> Um, and I woke up next morning and I was like, okay, today I'm going to do something totally different. And, um, and Did it bring you back to an awareness of who you are and why you do what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Every time, because I don't, with that kind of awareness, it's really hard to sabotage yourself on a constant basis. Like you, you look at yourself, it's like you become two people and you look and you just laugh and like, oh, Isabel, you're really trying to sabotage yourself? Well, a nice try. <laughs> it's really cute. Man, you can do that for a while, but we see what you're doing. <laughs> That's kind of how it works in my head. It's like, yeah, so just let me, let me sabotage myself right now. It just feels good, whatever. <laughs> like, I, I have those conversations. <laughs> it's also, it's also that understanding that it's, it's okay if you feel sad about something, you know, and you realize, oh, okay, maybe I had an attachment to this outcome, but it's okay. I can grieve that. And yeah. we know that the truth is goes beyond this one situation that, you know, had me feeling sad. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. With everything, like, if I would have not had this awareness with the with the guy, with the 20 year old, um, I would have felt guilty, but I would have carried that guilt with me and would have just gone home like, oh, whatever, I can change the situation anyways. But because I have this very strong and deep awareness at this point in my life, I knew exactly what I had to do. Nice. It took you beyond yeah. the, 
Always. Yeah. Supposed and to you're more willing to take the actions because when you have this awareness, you trust more. Mm, you trust is more so in a divine guidance. It's like in my head, I was like, okay, I, I really don't have the time to go back. I need to get this done and to get that done. And then I need to pick up my son again. And I need like all those things in my head. But because I have this awareness, I knew some voice was telling me like, go back, talk to him. Do I love what you teach. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's being very responsible, not only to, you know, any sense of responsibility to him, but all about being responsible and an alignment with yourself. Yeah. I love that. It's so, so uh, thank you so much for talking about this today. Cause I think that this is so key and um, beneficial for every single living person to be able to have this deeper awareness of their emotions and to what degree are they, um, you know, directing their life in a certain direction or not. And it's not about anybody else necessarily outside of them understanding what's going on, but rather yeah. us going within and understanding what's taking place within us. And then how are we, how are we using that outwardly in the world? So are there any, as we come to the end of this interview, are there any final words you'd like to leave today's audience with? <sighs> oh, any final words? Um, usually I have some, for some reason, I don't, I can't think of anything today. Um, any final words is that even if, and I just had this conversation with a client today, she will laugh if she will listen to it. Even if you, have a dispute with someone, or if you really just don't like someone, you hate someone. The only thing that really can shift the collective energy, if we can show compassion, we don't even have to be friends with them or give them a hug, but just the thought of it um, can shift the whole collective. So holding on to some grudges or holding on to some hate towards someone or holding on to um, any kind of hurt is actually impacting not just you as an individual but also the collective and if we ever want to see a more positive shift like what we see right now where people say the shift of awakening we will have to take that responsibility even if we try to fight it like but i want to hate them right now because i hate them i just want to hate them you know those kind of conversations if we just envision and let god do the work and say okay and divinely, I'm sending love and light and whatever they take, they take whatever not is not my responsibility, but I did my part right. because um, like Wayne Dyer always said in this book, he writes in this book, he said when he saw like youth groups fighting or some gangs in the park, he would stand away for a couple feet and just literally send out love and light and usually situations will calm down. That is the power that we have as individuals, as long as it's in the in service of that greater good and that greater understanding of of um, love. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Beautiful. It's yeah. I think it's you know we we tend to think that something has to be tangible and to have to make an impact, but it it doesn't have to be. It's coming within, going within sending it out energetically can make a huge shift for sure. Yeah. And when you do it, you realize that people suddenly feel really drawn to you. They love to tell you their story because they feel the non-judgment. They feel that you can trust them, that even though you may have done things that are really despicable, <laughs> they still allow you to be seen. Mm. <sighs> Is that weird? <laughs> find out more about you if they'd like to connect with you after this um definitely i keep everything simple because like i said everything is already over overwhelming um i have everything on my website isabelhunt.com it's i-s-a-b-e-l-h-u-n-d-t.com uh where you can find more about um how to work with me having me speak at your events especially around um shattering or shattering cultural barriers that's my main topic that i speak on and um, I also have a course um, called The Empowered Warrior, a simple guide to navigate your emotional world, <laughs> um, which has more of a spiritual approach to emotions. Okay. Almost like the emotions sitting in front of you and telling you who they are to you and for you. <laughs> wow, that's, that's, that's interesting. Like, 
like it's set up. Yeah. Well, Isabel, thank you so much for being here today. And I, um, I thought for sure you were, you're, you're going to be doing a TEDx talk at some point. I know that. I so. think so. <laughs> we'll see when. <laughs> yeah. So, so just keep us posted and I look forward to hearing about it. In fact, I almost like, you know, above this, um, this posting online, I almost said, you know, with TEDx speaker, Isabel Hunt. And, and then I, was like, <laughs> I, I seriously, I, I actually Googled it first and I was like, wait, wait, and I'm not quite seeing it. Okay, fine. Since I'm not hundred percent, I, I took it off, but nice. you're totally going to be a TEDx speaker. So don't worry. <laughs> I still have some applications out there. So <laughs> whatever is happening. Well, in two weeks, I'm going to speak an event called um, Humans First. That's another oh, movement. Um, nice. Which... I don't know if they will if there will be a Facebook Live with it, but I use part of my TEDx speech because it's it's just totally in alignment. It just opens the the conversation about how we can really start to come together as cultures, yet respecting the differences as well, and then just continuing some traditions, but also letting go of some things that we know is not actually in service of the collective. Wow. Wonderful. Well, I look forward to finding out when you have your TEDx talk. Me and... too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here today, Isabel. And thank you to all those that watched uh, with us live as well as that were on the replay. If you'd like to find out more about the Every Day is a New Day show, you can also check out uh, previous episodes over on YouTube or iTunes and let us know, you know, what you're taking away, what episodes you are loving and let us know in the replay here. You know, if you're listening on the replay, go ahead and put a hashtag replay in and let us know what you are taking away. And if you'd like to find out more about Isabel, Isabel, okay. You said isabelhunt.com. Is that correct? Yep. Right. Okay. So if you want to find out more about Isabel, you can go to isabelhunt.com. And if you'd like to find out more about the coaching work that I do, you can also go to kimoneilcoaching.com. And regardless of whatever you choose to do next, remember that every day is truly a new day. Wherever you are today does not have to be where you are tomorrow. And a fantastic way to be able to move into that new space, that new day feeling is, you know, it experimenting, exploring what we were talking about today and those emotions and those labels and choosing to open up the door to see things differently in your life and and even as who you are because you're so much more than whatever labels uh, you may currently you know have placed on yourself and have defined yourself. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful day and again going back with what Isabel was saying, have compassion even towards yourself, whatever you're going through right now. So that is our show for today. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. And that's today's show. So what are you taking away? Let me know down in the comments wherever you listened or watched today's episode and connect with me on Facebook on the Every Day is a New Day show and coaching page or visit KimO'NealCoaching.com for more info. Remember, every day is always a new day. Wherever you are today does not have to be where you are tomorrow. There is always hope. And you will always be amazing. I'll see you next time.